Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about capitalism, but this is going to be a very rambling video. And when I start, it's not going to sound like I'm talking about capitalism at all, but I am. So the other day I was watching a video complaining about the Fallout TV show. I'm not going to tell you which one. There's a lot of them. People have all kinds of problems with it and I get it. And I even agree with some of the problems. I just don't agree with the degree to which that problem degrades the show. So it's a matter of taste. I've talked about taste a lot. But I started reading the comments in this one and I saw a commenter that said, I only liked the show because I was paid to attend. Did a quick Google search. That comment has been made a number of times on a number of other videos as well. People assumed I was paid to attend the premiere. So let me make it clear right off the bat. I received an invitation, a digital invite, that included a ticket to get me into the theater to watch it. I paid for my airline tickets and all my Uber transportation to and from the, the theater and the hotel, and I paid for the hotel. I didn't get paid anything to watch the TV show. To the point where I had a friend who goes, are you sure you want to spend all this money just to see it 48 hours early? And I'm like, I could see it on IMAX. I get to ask questions from some of the creators afterwards. Yes, I'm, I want to go see this. But the comment itself made me wonder, why are so many people assuming I got paid to do it? And I had this realization. I had this... Poof. Now, I mentioned it to a work co colleague of mine, and they gave me the look. That made me realize that everybody else already knows this and I'm just being naive and optimistic. I've got a video about that. But what my realization was, was this. People say that because if the situation was reversed and it was them in that position, that's what they would have done. They would have been asked to get paid to do that. They would have expected to be paid to do that and they wouldn't have done it unless they would have been paid. And I was like, whoa. Because I started thinking of all the things that have happened to me where, you know, people said I, I fired, got them fired or tried to get them fired or that I stole source code or whatever, or I took the biggest bonus or whatever, and they believed it. And I realized that they're saying these things because they would have done that themselves given the opportunity. That given the opportunity and a slight bit of power, these people would have behaved badly. So it's not a big leap for them to think I would have behaved badly too in that situation. And I was like, whoa, that really makes me look at some situations that happened to me in the past differently. Now, I realize this is just another lens to look at things. And some people thought the, what they thought because they've had that bad thing happen to them. You know, they've had, you know, a bonus removed from them or they've been fired by, by a previous boss on for not really, you know, good terms or good reasons. But they're thinking I did it. And enough people thought that, that I knew didn't have those past bad experiences that some of them at the very minimum are just projecting. And I thought really hard about that because you all know I ran Troika with Leonard and Jason. So I'm, I've run a company. I've been, I've been an employer. I'm an ex-employer. But I read a ton of hostile comments on this channel towards employers. And it's hard because... Every, the, the people who say it, they put the entire 100% onus of all the problems that occur in the workplace on the owners. Person didn't finish their work, owner was bad and didn't estimate it right, or didn't motivate them, or didn't pay them enough, or didn't explain it, or whatever. And there's people, I know there's some of them that are just exaggerating to prove a point, but some people on here really do seem to believe that it's never the employee's fault on anything. And it made me go back and go, I tried really hard when I was at Troika to be a really good employer. We gave everyone big bonuses and we paid everyone the same amount. And there were a lot of perks like food and, you know, on-site daycare and all these other things. I've talked about that. But if I'm going to get lumped in with bad employers anyway, it occurred to me, should I have just been a bad employer? It would have been easier. It would have been way easier just to tell people, I'm not explaining to you this feature. Just do what I say. It would have been a lot more lucrative to just pay people a lot less and say, I'm paying you what you're worth and you're lucky to get paid that. Yeah, that would have been easier. And if I if I would have known that years later people were going to say I was doing that anyway and no one talks about anything good that employers do ever do, well, 
it made me go, why didn't I just act that way? And it made me think of all the things I've thought about capitalism before where maybe a lot of companies treat us a certain way because we've taught them to treat us badly. There's been a few bad apples, a few bad employees that have triggered a behavior from the employer, but now all the good employees think horribly of the employer not caring about the bad employees because in their mind, there are no bad employees. And now it's all the onus, all the onus is on the employer. And I can pull it out. I've got two examples I always pull out of my story chest when I talk about this. And one of them is airlines. I started flying in the 80s. I'd never flown before that. I never flew before I actually got on a plane when I was 21 to go out to grad school in California from Virginia. Never been on a plane before that. Let me just tell you, flying back then was really different. Really different. People could come and meet, uh, set, come to the gate to meet you or send you off. There was very little security. Uh, the airlines were regulated, so the prices were all about the same, and they were pretty low. I mean, I would flew, I would fly cross country for 200, 200 bucks, two hundred fifty bucks. This is back in nineteen eighty seven. But let me talk about some of the things that happened back then that are different now. There was something called bereavement fairs where if someone had died in your immediate family, you could call an airline and they would give you the lowest fare available on that flight, regardless of what seat it is. So if the lowest flight and the lowest seat price in economy was $180, but they only had a seat in first class, you'd be sitting in first class for $180. Well, people started lying about that. Oh yeah, my grandmother died again. So that became a big enough problem that airlines started asking for proof. They started asking for a death certificate. Yes, when my father died in the early 90s, I had to get his death certificate from the funeral director to show to the airline that's why I missed my flight and could they please put me on a flight a couple days later. It was soul-sucking. But they do that because of all the bad apples that had come before me. Same thing for meals. Once... Um, Tickets for airlines started be being available online. People just bought the cheapest fare they could, and they didn't care what wasn't included. They would pay $10 less for a ticket, even if it didn't include meals. Then they'd complain the meals were bad anyway. Suddenly, all the airlines stopped providing meals and coach. Why? No one's going to pay for it, so why do it? And then they, the same people who bought the $10 cheap ticket complained about airlines getting rid of meals all, all across the board. Same thing with check luggage. Airlines um, would put up cheaper fares because they were going to charge you 10 bucks, 20 bucks to check your bag. People were like, ah, just carry it on. Suddenly, everybody's carrying it on. Suddenly, there's not room. Suddenly, flights are getting delayed and people are having to leave their luggage at the gate because there literally is no room on the, uh, the carry-on slots, the, the upper baggage bins. And then they're having to be put down below anyway. And they blame the airlines for that, for their own behavior. And they're, they're, yeah, a lot of them are like, well, they're charging us for it. It's like, they didn't used to. You guys lowballed them into this position and now they had to start charging those fees. And then, then once they realized they'd make money from them, then of course they did it. But what started it was people's behavior. And a lot of people like to argue that, but I was alive during this period and I watched it happen. Um, and it makes me go, I guess we live in the capitalist society that we all together created. It's, it's similar to on my channel on a previous video, and I can't remember which one. I recommended people just not pay for things if they disagree with it. I said, if you don't like a game, don't buy it. And the response was, well, that only works if everybody does it. And you're right, and, but you should still do it and encourage people to do it. Because it's, it's, it's like what happened with spam. I was around when the first spam email came out in the early 90s. It was uh, some lawyers offering green cards to immigrants. That was the very first spam email that ever went out on the internet. And I got it. We were in an uproar. Like, how dare people do this? But guess what? Spam continued. Why? Because a few people, used, a few people bought the product off spam. And that's the spam problem in a nutshell. If just one person ignores it or reports it, nothing's going to happen. But if everybody did that, it would be gone tomorrow. And if most people did it, it would go away. But they don't. So for products, if you don't buy it, it has no effect. A lot of people have to not buy it or everyone has to not buy it. I've said this for microtransactions. Everybody decries microtransactions and says, these are terrible. 
but I found a lot of people who don't like them do them. And when I pushed them on it, they were like, well, why should I bother? It has no effect if I buy one. Well, yeah, but that makes you part of the problem. If you decry part of the capitalist environment, but then take part in it, the thing you don't like, you're contributing. Now, I know people are like, well, I have to at this point because this it has been created. It's true. But if you believe other people will act like you, but you don't act like you believe, I don't see how you don't see yourself as part of the problem. You have to act on your beliefs, even if it means you don't take a job that pays you better because you don't agree with the ethical ethics of that company. Even if it means you don't buy a game that you think you know, would be fun, but it, that they do things you don't like, like microtransactions. Just don't do it. And while that's the TLDW of this video, I would like to remind you before you leave a comment, I've been on both sides of this thing in every direction. I've been both inside of game development and outside of game development. I've been a company owner and a manager and I've been an employee. I've seen all the different sides. I've seen the bad things that everybody does on all the sides. That's why it's very hard for me to ever point a finger and go 100% 100 of the blame is right here because I've watched people do these things. I've watched people buy products they don't like, complain about it, but all the company cared about is we sold that product. They bought something from my spam email. They bought the, the airplane ticket that didn't include a meal or check bags. I guess they don't care about this stuff. If you want companies to care, vote with your wallet. It's the simplest, most effective way of doing it. Yes, many of you have to do that before it works. But if you don't do it because you think other people won't do it, you're just part of the problem. And that's Tim's salty take on capitalism in 2024.